Okay, good afternoon. If you'd like to take your seat. Okay. So, you've got everyone's undivided attention? <laughs> Excellent. Um, welcome uh, to this event um, as part of the, uh, the SLEUS programme of events uh, here in Colchester. Um, the like, kind of premise around uh, this discussion event, and it is a discussion, not just uh, as, as talking, so as having a, a conversation, and we want to open that up as well, to have a kind of dialogue uh, with, with you guys. Um, we're looking at how uh, form impacts, is impacted by funding, how funding impacts form, the relationship between those two things. It's a bit of a sticky issue for a lot of artist-run, artist-led initiatives. Um, the concern can oscillate as well between states of absolute um, uh, conf confusion, uh, poverty, um, moments of abundance. You know, with the, the whole kind of gamut is potentially uh, there at different moments uh, and, in, and, in, and in different contexts. So we're going to kind of move across those uh, in quite a discursive way, prob probably, uh, and see where we kind of end up. So my name is Dan Pryde-Jarman, and I'm an artist and curator. I've also run Artist Run Spaces before, and I run a space at the moment called Meter Room in Coventry. So Meter Room is an art studio and project space that's based in the city centre, and that's been running for 13 years now. Before that, I was running a gallery called Grey Area back in, in Brighton, which I opened in 2006. And I went through lots of different uh, uh, iterations for, how, for, for models for how those things could survive. And more recently, I've got more of a kind of official standing as, or something like that as part of an, artist, um, an arts council funded organisation. So I'm the chair of Meadow Arts, which uh, works on quite, quite large scale uh, contemporary art uh, projects uh, in the public sphere uh, in, in the west of England. So that's me. We've got another, a number of other speakers here who are coming at this kind of question from all sorts of different perspectives. So um, I shall welcome them. First up, we have uh, Eve Woods. So Eve is a curator uh, and program producer at Palace Projects in Dublin. Uh, Eve, Eve is also co-founder of Contemporary Quarters. Uh, Contemporary Quarters pushes back against overdevelopment of temporary living quarters and the removal and privatisation of spaces previously used for community arts and culture. Okay, so we've got Eve. Uh, we have uh, Pamela as well, Pamela Grombacher. Uh, Pamela is a co-founder and co-director of Juxtapose Art Fair in Aarhus, Denmark. Juxtapose is a non-profit uh, international gathering for artist-run initiatives and self-organised practices in Aarhus, Denmark. Pamela is also project leader at Aarhus Centre for Visual, uh, Visual Art with a focus on international collaborations, research and residencies. And last but not least, somebody who's probably known to a number of you uh, in Colchester is Ben Cood Adams. He's an artist who's born and lives in Essex. Ben co-directs artist-led Blackwater Polytechnics. You may have seen some of those projects uh, on show at the moment in the, in the Minories. He's also chair of the trustees of the Minories. Uh, ben also is a prize-winning artist uh, um, who's won a Watercolour Society Prize in 2018. Get that, get that in there. So these are people with credentials. <laughs> okay, so... Um, it was a cash prize. Excellent, well, wow. yeah. so drinks on you later then. Yeah. Um, so one of the kind of underlying premises of this event is you know, how funding or lack of funding uh, impacts the stability of the cultural sector, how artist-led and artist-run activities are affected by that, and the nature of the art that's kind of produced under that umbrella, maybe. So inevitably, we might be thinking about kind of uh, precarity uh, and, and um, socioeconomic issues pertaining to that, but also maybe we'd be thinking about kind of opportunities as opposed to um, simply the lack of funding, well, how might we also be kind of operating differently, I suppose, to kind of account for what, we, what it is that we can do. So um, I'm going to ask each of our uh, speakers here how their current projects or organisations are funded and how the nature of that funding has shaped their projects. So we'll start with you, Eve. That's OK. Hi. Um, I'm Eve, so I work in Palace Projects, which is an artist-led gallery and studios in Dublin City. It has survived 28 years in Dublin in various forms. So it started as a response um, to the lack of spaces to have studio and exhibit. So it was started by Mark Cullen and Brian Duggan, who were two artists uh, at the time. And they both, one of now is one of our directors and the other still works as an artist. So uh, through responding agilely to these challenges has actually made 
the form of Palace more interesting. You know, in, they would have hoped, we'll get funding, it will be in our studios and in our gallery, and it will exist, and maybe people will get paid. You know, that's kind of the, the hope. But uh, that wasn't the reality. But some of the projects that came out of that are the most memorable projects. So Palace lost their original studios, which was an old knitwear factory. So Palace Knitwear was the, where the name came from. And we're lobbying Dublin City Council at the time for provision of studios. So this was around 1999. It began uh, with the lobbying, still hasn't come to fruition of any permanent studio spaces in the city. But they were given three apartments in a tower block that was social housing that was due for demolition. So they were given this up until the point where they said, we're going to prepare for demolition. So artists were able to work long term within these flats and host exhibitions and have the local community interact with them. And it allowed a much freer uh, kind of program of gallery exhibitions. Um, and then following that, that space was cut then through collaboration, which is another um, strength of Palace. Like that's another way they've been able to survive is kind of through this sharing of resources and reaching out and helping people when they need it. Um, they were able to use some of the rooms in the Dublin City Gallery, Hugh Lane. So they ran a program there for a summer while they had no home, um, while the building was being um, built on one side. That's why the regular programming wasn't there. And then, um, so there's been nine different buildings for Palace over the years, some of which have been six months. The space that we're currently in now has existed for 12 years, but for the past two years, we're under threat of moving because it's a private landlord and he wants to develop the site into luxury apartments. So it's always this pressure exerted from the lack of a, uh, a building that's owned. And so it's kind of this occupying force that moves um, even as far as there was exhibitions in Limerick City at Orpenston House, which is another artist run space there. So it's through all of this, uh, not uh, a fixed view of what Palace should exist as, I guess. And then that extends into the publication and kind of online resources as well. Um, kind of separately from that, Contemporary Quarters, which was mentioned, is a collaboration with myself and another artist, which came about through our frustration of living in an area that was being rapidly gentrified. Um, three uh, studios that we inhabited had been demolished, and it's purpose-built student accommodation and luxury apartments and hotels. So like there's 15 hotels built within a 15 minute walk radius, say, for it's a very small area, the oldest part of Dublin. Um, but that is not funded particularly, where that's more just a vent for us to uh, bring our frustrations out onto the streets and use public spaces, kind of take over ownership of them, occupy them, and then invite people to come and have conversations with us about what's affecting them in their locality. Well, I think, you know, the, the, the impact of um, uh, residential development on, on, the, on the spaces that are occupied by artists, artists-run kind of activities. It's a kind of as old as the hills, really, that mm -hmm. relationship. That's literally happening to me right now with Meter Room in Coventry. So the city council own that building, and they're looking to put um, accommodation in there for international students, mm -hmm. primarily targeted at the Chinese market. Mm -hmm. So, um, And that will probably close that operation. So with the nine times that you've moved previously, <laughs> has it always been an economic imperative that dri that's driven that move? Yes. Uh, every time. Um, so Dublin 8, where we are now, is kind of the last inner city quarter to be developed. So they started off in Dublin 1 and have moved in kind of oh, circle around the river. And now we're more at the most west, uh, the point where we're trying, we're fighting to stay there. Um, but it is always um, just, the, uh, like our rents have gone up uh, 40% in one space that we have studios in. And even though the site we're in currently uh, is due to be, we're due to be moved out of there, the land was like, you can stay until we demolish it, but we'll also put your rent up while you're staying. So, um, and we're funded by the Arts Council. So we subsidize the studios 
for the artists. Like artists still have to pay, but it is at a lower than market rate. But that is becoming increasingly more difficult. Um, and yeah. yeah <laughs> I mean, that's what what attempting offer that is, isn't it? You know, stay until you're demolished. What what what, what, what an offer. Um, so if we move over to Pam now, if I pass you the. Thanks, Daniel. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm Pam, um, originally from Canada, but I've lived in Denmark for the last eight and a half years. Um, and before then, I was living in uh, the San Francisco Bay Area for a couple of years. And that was kind of my first taste of you know, working and starting my career was in a landscape that had like no funding, like the American arts funding situation is horrendous. Um, and in an artist-run space that was also fighting for to stay where they were for 30 years, and uh, um, it was a lot of you know scrappy fundraising and kickstarters and um, uh, sh schmoozing you know private private donors and things like that. So then when I moved to Denmark, it was um, like shocking, uh, just the. Uh, the, how, the glut of funding, I would say, in comparison to the states. Um, and so I've kind of moved through the Danish funding systems in different ways across my different projects. Um, so uh, my kind of consistent part-time job over the past eight years has been at like a municipally funded office that does professional uh, development and like a resource center basically for artists working in the city and in the region. Um, and we have like some um, basic funding from the city and then have been getting, you know, external funding for different projects. Um, but this has been a big question for us um, is because we're going to be moving into an, a new space at the end of next year and moving from a small office with two people to taking over a building with I think 11 studios and possibilities for exhibition spaces and things like that. So there's been a lot of like behind the scenes political lobbying to try and get the city to increase the rent um, rather than going through typical funding structures but doing more of like a political outreach for like longer term support from the city. Um, I also worked like as a freelance curator mostly with artist run spaces for maybe five, six years, and did a lot of like project-based arts funding and was really lucky that almost almost everything got some sort of funding in one way or another. Um, and then the big, I mean, the reason why I'm, I'm connected with Carl and at Sluice is because I run a similar fair for artist-run projects um, called Juxtapose Art Fair. Um, we're pretty new. We just launched in 21 and had our second edition last September, and then we'll, we're planning the third edition now in uh, June 2025, so basically exactly a year from now. Um, and we are heavily reliant on, on uh, we're 100% reliant on funding, and we have had success so far, thankfully, um, from the city and the region and also like different Nordic funds. Um, but we know that this is a kind of a, a finite resource because even though there are a lot of funds available, um, you, you, we've had success because we've met the niche of these funds. And you know, when you've received your support for a number of years, they, they kind of, they're not gonna support you indefinitely. So we're trying to th think ahead a little bit and um, we were lucky because we actually got a research and development grant from a private fund just to figure out how to become more financially sustainable as a fair. Um, so it's like this incredibly uh, kind of privileged position we're in right now where we have money that's just to figure out how to get off of grant money. Um, and so we're just, but that's kind of an impossible question to answer at the same time. So we're, uh, we're just starting to like try to figure out how to tackle this question and, and talking to different consultants about what possibilities there could be in different kinds of business partnerships and things like that. So you're entirely funded by 
public funding? Yeah, we were, were funded, um, I think, I, I, I don't think we have had any private funding. I think it's been all state funding, city funding, yeah. regional funding, and then Nordic funding as well, which has been a big factor in how we organize our programming and our partnerships is for eligibility for like these, these Nordic grants. Mm -hmm. Do you think when you, because you know, you use the term art fair to juxtapose art, yeah. the term art fair yeah. uh, is received in certain ways in yeah. terms of funding, like it, whether it's more positive or negative. Yeah, right? it was really not strategic to call ourselves an art fair <laughs> at all because people, I, I think it's, um, it's a hurdle in getting the funds to understand that we're not a commercial, I mean, it's possible to sell works, artists can, and artists keep 100% of whatever they do sell. But I think because it's not like a curated exhibition in that sense, that there's some eligibility questions there for, for like private foundations that are disinclined to yeah. fund an art fair, yeah. Well, I was, wondering, yeah, I was wondering how strategic it was, whether it was, it might be use, it might not be a useful term for some things, but it might be useful for other things, attracting a private sponsorship or? Well, we'll find fee, out. Fee th yeah, yeah, this is the question I think for this year. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you, yep. uh, Pam. So if we move over to you now, Ben, well, you're going to get two. Okay. Um, uh, all my notes that, that I wrote, <laughs> I may come on to them, but they're a little bit irrelevant, I think. Um, oh, they sound good. Uh, well, uh, yeah, maybe. Well, yeah. So I'll talk about the Minories a bit. The Minories has no public funding at all. It is all private funding. So we have... Uh, so it's coming from private trusts. So these are family trusts often. And um, uh, we've tried to get public funding, but unsuccessfully, mainly because we're sitting in this big vacuum that hoovers up all the regional funding. Um, and is a, what, what's called in the UK an MPO, which is a national portfolio organization. So they get guaranteed regular funding for five years. We don't have any of that. We live month to month. And uh, so our growth area for funding is in earned income. So this means doing stuff that earns money. So, uh, and that's quite challenging, but we've been reasonably successful at that. And at the moment, we're quite secure for the next few months. Uh, and hopefully it will carry on like that. Uh, my experience has been that if you've got money, you can get more money. If you haven't got any money, it's really, really hard. Mm -hmm. So what I was going to just say, my rant is coming up now. <laughs> rant alert. So I think that the funding system in the UK is completely broken. And the Arts Council only funds, and with the best will in the world, they're all nice, decent people trying to do the right thing. They're only funding 30% of applications. Which means, imagine the work that has been put into writing all those thousands of applications that are being turned down. So they're asking for way much, too much work to put the application in, then, then the application fails, so all that work is wasted. They've got to employ all the people to assess all those uh, applications. So if they had a much more streamlined system where they were asking two questions, then they wouldn't need so many people to assess it, so they'd have more money to give out. It would all work much better. So recent, I, my other hat, one of my other hats is that I work on the family farm, or I work with the, our family farm. And I recently applied for a grant to buy a timber trailer. It literally, all you had to do was write your address <laughs> <laughs> and hand it into the, um, the, into the grant-making body. And then uh, you hear three months later whether you got the grant. And they know, they can look you up on their register of farms and they can see what you are and what you do, and then they know what a timber trailer is, so they know what they're going to get. So it, that seemed to me like a much better way. And 
So that's part, first part of the rant. If I, had, I can no, do no, the second can, part. Yeah, no, okay, up. second part of the rant <laughs> is to do with um, uh, private trusts, <laughs> which are absolutely wonderful, and the UK culture ecosystem would not exist without them. So we get money from Garfield Western, which is a huge funder. They've funded the British Museum, and they fund the Royal Academy, and there's a number of other trusts like that, like Esme Fairbairn. So Esme Fairbairn, the, there's a pre-application for that, which is a good thing, that's great. But they've decided, the board have decided, that they only want to fund work in these particular areas, which are food, land, and uh, visual culture. So that you think, oh, well, that's great. Well, we've got land, and we work with visual culture, so we've got two at least. And, uh, uh, but it actually turns out, in reality, they fund all the people that they always fund. Mm -hmm. When you look, look back through their reports over the years, they've actually always funded the same people. So it's, there's a big gap between what funders say they will fund and what they actually fund. And uh, there's the thing that annoys me most in all the world, and the Arts Council does this too. So they say grants up to £100,000. So mm. we always put in a grant up for £100,000. Turns out they never give a grant for £100,000. Mm. They only give grants for £10,000. Mm. So why put in that you can apply for up to 100000 It's a complete waste of everybody's thought, mental space, mm. at rent over. <laughs> that's a good. No, it's a good rent. It's a good rent. And, and you know, I think it's a rent we probably all, all share in different kind of ways. I was thinking about my own um, kind of experience of running artist-run spaces. Um, how I've had to move to a kind of state of uh, professionalisation or apparent professionalisation. Maybe because you know I thought it's what I was supposed to do, or that I thought that was, would make me more eligible for various grants. Ones I'd heard of, ones I hadn't heard of, ones I thought other people were getting, and I and I, and I was missing out on. Um, so with Grey Area, you know, I formed a steering group of, um, you know, a kind of chaotic group of, uh, of people that would linger around the, the space and, and, and contribute uh, to the programme in different ways. And I thought, well, you know, yeah, that, that's what we need is a steering group. And at, meet, at Meter Room, um, that, I ended up registering that as a charity, actually, to, to be able to meet certain requirements requirements and the biggest requirement the biggest hurdle and probably the biggest thing I think that local councils could do in relation to all of this stuff it was business rates like they were happy for me to crack on they would even drop the the rent load to help it um, as long as it wouldn't cost them anything else because they were just storing stuff there anyway or mothballing a resource that was okay it was the business rates that were the killer so when you hear that um, so at Birmingham is cutting 100% of funding to Icon Gallery this is an internationally um, you know, a well-known gallery with big international programmes in the second city of the United Kingdom, fifth largest economy, and having 100% of their funding cut, you know, from the local council. I mean, it's just it's torturous, isn't it? But one thing that can happen at a, at a lower level is if, if more kind of self-organised practices were actually not all just crippled with the idea of business rates. That's something they can do. Now, unfortunately, local councils can't actually drop uh, business rates. It's set nationally, it's actually the kind of central government that sets an idea of business rates. And all local councils are due to pay it if, if there's any kind of activity there. If they change that regulation and they gave different local councils the ability to, 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 to drop it or annul it, I think that would be a, a massive change. So that's not really a rant. But no, that's my, 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 that was a rant. It's it. a good rant. <laughs> okay. The business rate rant. The business rate rant. But if I, if I start to move then into this idea of kind of professionalisation, I think, you know, so much of what it is that um, we, we seem to do uh, in this kind of sector is around um, self-organising, making claim to agency, um, creating our own subjectivity with all of those things and resisting certain ideas of professionalisation, maybe. But how have you made it work for you, this idea of having to somehow uh, be more professional in order to be more eligible and meet more, um, more requirements um, for funders? That's a question for you. Um, yeah, Palace uh, has been uh, registered as a non-profit CLG for a number of years, so we had a board and all of those kind of things, which was a certain level of, uh, required a certain level of paperwork, but we did recently become a charity uh, in order to access funds 
that there was an international investor program who were hoping to access funds in order to get a long-term building so we could exist. Um, but unfortunately, by the time we became a charity, that fund no longer exists because too many people were, knew it existed. <laughs> the wrong yeah. types of organizations were applying for it, I guess. So the government shut it down, but um, which you know, means we have so much more paperwork and it's more of a capacity strain, uh, but there's always this um, tension between having the paperwork in order to be eligible for the funding, but then also retaining or refusing to become institutionalized and retaining that there's artists at every level. So everybody that works in Palace is an artist. Everyone, none of us are full time. The maximum anyone works is four days a week, but it varies and up to board level, we um, retain artists on the board as well. That, that always has to be artist led. Um, we, we don't really have the opportunity to be under a Dublin City Council building, but we also don't want to be. We want to maintain our independence within a building um, where we're, we can control what we do. Uh, we do have some studios that are in a uh, government-run land development agency site, and if we want to do anything there, even we moved in uh, 21 artists to studios there when we thought we were going to lose our building last year, uh, but even just having like pizza and beers for the artists was like an eight page health and safety document and they said it would cost 3,000 euro to have security guards and put up barriers in the, uh, the courtyard so that people wouldn't walk into traffic. But they don't have those any other time of day. It was just ridiculous. We were like, we can get sponsorship for beer and we'll buy 100 euro of pizzas. You just have to say yes. But it's like, like that's a very small example of how difficult it becomes when you're, that your physical space is being controlled by some other organization. So we try to maintain our independence by finding these gaps in little spaces. Like we're currently in an old school building um, with the new school next door. So we have a courtyard um, so we can use that for events and then we can do what we want to do with the space. Um, but obviously those pockets, those gaps of spaces are getting smaller, I guess is the, the problem. Yeah, we're in, um, as I said, an old schoolhouse, so it has beautiful sash windows that are crumbling. Um, like you would just uh, every now and again hear some, the ceiling coming down in random studios all of the time. It's just like in the walls. Uh, so yeah, it's very difficult uh, in that sense. Like we might end up staying in that building, but if long term we did stay, we are battling with those kind of things. So like if you want new windows, it's like 200 grand, yeah. you know, easily. Um, so, yeah, so if, if we had a building, then we would be eligible to apply for the Department of Arts funding as opposed to the Arts Council, but in order to get that funding, you have to be in a building long term. So like the longest lease we've had was 10 years. So we wouldn't be eligible for those kind of infrastructure grants, um, so which is limiting, but, um, and then as well, you're saying the kind of the board structure, it enforces this hierarchy, whereas we're always trying to maintain a non-hierarchical system, like, because everyone that works with us has their own skills and their own history. So um, it's, yeah, trying to flatten that, that's kind of forced then through the, the policy <laughs> yeah. is always a struggle. It's, it's true, isn't it? If you stand with something, some kind of horizontalism, mm -hmm. you, you nevertheless have to elect a chair. And, you know, if, even if you think it's a nominal thing, you, mm -hmm. still, you still have done it, you still have governance that then you have to abide by, even mm -hmm. if you feel like, out of principle, mm -hmm. you, know, you really want to do something different. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, thank you. About, um, so thanks. I think we should move over to a set of questions around... Um, what about audience? Uh, one more question. Um, around the kind of, well, it's... It, it's a term that's kind of coined, really. Sluice uh, vernacular, isn't it? So this idea of the, the vernacular, so the excellent premise of the, um, of, of the, the Sluice um, kind of festival, um, it made me really think about the vernacular of uh, the kinds of uh, activities that we're involved in, uh, the vernacular of artist-run spaces, artist-led spaces, the means of production, 
what these spaces look like, how the means of production, a DIY approach or, or ethos or a, a lo-fi attitude, how those things can actually end up having a certain kind of aesthetic be underpinned by certain principles, and that in itself can, can, can lead to a vernacular. You said there about uh, crumbling uh, ceilings or something, you know, and the, there's a few kind of knowing looks, like we know what it's like to make art and to show art in buildings that, that are crumbling or with things that aren't quite how you might not de design them, but that you're like living around. So uh, how, how might that idea of the, the, the kind of vernacular of these kinds of spaces influence the way we think about them and the way that work is experienced in them, do you think? So I'm going to go over to you, Ben. What do you oh, think okay. um, uh, I, our building is obviously a vernacular building with a kind of veneer, aristocratic veneer on the back and the front, Georgian veneer on a Tudor, three, four Tudor houses that have been knocked together. Um, and so we're kind of living in an architectural vernacular and we, I've been, since I became chair, and obviously what I say goes, because I am the chair, and we're very hierarchical, um, uh, and I'm a middle-aged white man, so obviously <laughs> everyone has to do what I say. Uh, we've been... That microphone does pick up sarcasm. <laughs> <laughs> just, just check it so that it doesn't come back to the point. Yes, or not entirely sarcastic. I am a middle-aged white man. Well, that's, yeah. Uh, very privileged with a middle-aged white man. Um, and uh, I, we grapple with notions of quality, I suppose, for want of a better word. So we are very much there to serve our, everybody in our community, whatever stage of professionalism they're at. And that, for me... I'm not really looking for traditional notions of quality or like, oh, it looks like international contemporary art or it looks like uh, artists run space. I'm looking for integrity, I think. And so I think that when people are doing something that they genuinely believe is the right yeah. thing to be doing, whether they're someone who just paints you know, half a day a week or less, that is what I'm interested in. Mm. Is that? Yeah, yeah. And that's my vernacular. It's your vernacular. It's a nice quote by Thomas Herschel where he says, um, uh, oh, <laughs> oh, it's only a quick one. Just, um, you know, energy, yes, quality, no. Yeah, this idea. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, pass to you, Pam. Yeah. How do you think about that? I, you know, I, I'm still wrapping my mind around this theme of vernacular, I think, in, in many ways. Um, and I think, you know, it's kind of funny to think about it with the artist run because there are, you know, every space is so different, right? And it's like every space takes its own, has its own story, how it came to be and things. But I guess if I'm reflecting on like um, the artist run scene in Aarhus, it is I don't think there are spaces like um, that could be mistaken as like you know is museum gallery institutions like I think Palace Projects is is like you know a very polished artist run institution right <laughs> I, is that fair to say um, and like we we have a few. Um, that have been around for 25, 30 years in Aarhus, but they're still in these like very small spaces, these very kind of, um, they're, they've, they've maintained this like, uh, I don't think that they've kind of institutionalized in that way. So it's interesting like traveling around and, and seeing other um, uh, artist run spaces that like, you know, based on the building and the, the viewing experience, the aesthetic experience, you know, have more in common, maybe with like a Kunsthalle or something like that. Mm. Um, I think that like where we are in our house, it's very much like um, w within stu the, the artist run spaces are like within studio collectives or in old studios or, you know, tucked away in these back courtyards. So it's, it's, they feel very 
um, kind of like cozy <laughs> in a way. Um, I don't really know if that answers your question because I'm still not, I'm still wrapping my head around this whole vernacular thing. What about the, the vernacular of art fairs and and how they look, the aesthetic of them, the the, the way that makes us think about how art could or should be experienced, mm. um, with, even with some of your um, just the photographs. Sorry. Um, um, how how the spaces are kind of laid out and the use of plywood or modular OSB type systems yeah. and um, showing work on, on those materials in that yeah. way is very particular. How does that condition our, um, our experience as, as audiences? Mm. Is that one? Yeah, maybe. Um, yeah, we, I think we were really uh, deliberate in, in wanting like the infrastructure of juxtaposed to be different than um, like commercial fairs that are, have these kind of white cubed up like divisions and these white booths. Um, and so we had a like a competition with the local architecture school and um, some, we had I think four or five different groups of students um, propose uh, these modular uh, systems for like having the exhibitors build their own booth. And so what we have are these, um, these wooden boards that are maybe the size of this tabletop that have like slits kind of cut into them. And then they can be, they can slide into each other and they kind of assemble like Lego um, without any power tools or anything. And then you can just kind of build out your own um, structure to present whatever artwork mm. the exhibitors are showing. Um, and uh, with some kind of bigger boards that can be inserted for a flat surface or something like that. And it's, I think it's like really consistent and like supportive of like the, the focus of Juxtapose. I mean, we have the name Juxtapose because we wanna, we don't curate thematically. Um, the, the idea is to have as broad um, of a, kind of overview of different artist run projects as possible to show all the different ways that artists contribute to the arts ecosystem and all the different ways in which artists um, kind of claim the power to produce and represent and you know distribute their own work. Um, so building your own physical space within the fair is also like uh, really supportive of that idea. But it's also kind of, um, it's, it was really exciting in the second edition because I think people got really creative with their use of the modules mm -hmm. and we're using it in, we have a user model, like manual, it's almost like an Ikea booklet or something like that with like how you can put it together and how the physics of it kind of work and things you have to consider to make it safe and things. But um, people have been using the, model, the modules in ways that the architects hadn't uh, thought about and that yeah. we hadn't thought about. Mm. So. The, they are also um, a, an infrastructure for creativity on mm. top of the artwork themselves. Um, and, uh, and it also makes for this like, really kind of funny viewing experience because um, it's, it's, not a, it's not like a strictly delineated um, fair because of this, the booths kind of it's booths is not the right word, right? And so it kind of, you have to move throughout the, in the space in a, in a different way. And sometimes the, the shows, you know, you have to kind of do a little work to figure out yeah. what's what in a mm. kind of an interesting way. And I think it can also like, um, it forces collaboration, I think, between the exhibitors. If they have to share a wall, mm. they have to negotiate like, how high should this be? How long should this be? And like, mm. so it's, it, it creates a really inter interesting like situation of like co-creation within the fair itself. And I think in a way that can kind of um, invite the, the viewer to be curious and explore the space yeah. in a different way as well. Yeah, well, the, yeah, the kit is kind of underpinned by a, some kind of collaborative notion, but also the idea of a, almost like a construction set idea. You know, mm. the thing that things can evolve, it doesn't all need to be kind of fixed or static. Or yeah. Change. Okay, so now I think it's quite a good cue to hand over to you guys if there are any uh, questions in the room. I'm 
Oh, we'd, oh, we have a ro roving, roaming uh, <laughs> microphone. Uh, that's good. So um, I think we've got a question over there in the back. Uh, chat with the hat. Uh, hi, I just wanted to ask about um, meanwhile spaces, whether that's still a term people use um, thinking about the school mainly. Uh, is that in the bracket of a meanwhile space? Or? Um, no, it's actually owned by a private landlord. But there was a uh, meanwhile space kind of initiative a few years ago in Dublin City that was run by the council and um, lots of um, exhibition and studio spaces existed then and then it's since been shut down and a lot of those spaces are now offices and like some are still empty but the initiative is just over but um, there is kind of people so if people want to develop a site in Dublin they it has to be empty for a certain period of time beforehand so we are trying to argue for that people should be able to use the space as a, like a meanwhile space and then the uh, whoever owns it can say, okay, we'll start work tomorrow. Please leave, and it's a you know an agreement between the organisations. Like there was a really nice place called the Chestnut Bazaar, which was a gallery, studio spaces, and kind of like a food market. But they had a fire pit, and people could just go and sit there and hang out. And you didn't need to buy anything to be there. And they had like performances and things outdoors. And that site was set to develop, and the landlord had said, I want them to stay up until. I actually going to start work and the council said no it has to be vacant for like a year before you start which is just so stupid really um but no we're actually in a a private space so uh Col I, I don't probably uh, carl knows more about this than i do uh but we in colchester there's a a, a letting agent called avia mm -hmm. who um work on behalf of uh uh, landlords to let out to charities um, uh, empty shop units. So we have one. If you walk up Priory Street, uh, Priory Walk, which is where the Sainsbury's is, all the shops on the left, or nearly all the shops on the left, are um, let to charities. Uh, and we had one which we were using exclusively because there was work going on in the minerals and we couldn't use it. Um, and uh, but actually, we don't really have the resources to run it, so uh, we sublet it secretly to, uh, <laughs> to yeah to a, uh, a graffiti artist. So he runs that space, um, which has worked out really well for us because it can be used. I mean, we're not we haven't sublet it. He's not giving us money, but we've kind of, <laughs> we've let him use it. Um, and the other spaces are, were taken on by Cultural Arts Centre because they're a charity, and then they're used by African families in the UK, which is a CIC, but therefore didn't qualify for the rates. Uh, it's all about business rate, mm. is what it comes yeah. down to. And the charities can get, in Colchester anyway, can get 100% discount after a lot of form filling. Because you have to apply for the 80% first, Mm. Which is discretionary from the council, and then the final twenty percent has to be is is has to be approved in a separate process. I think the eighty percent is mandatory. The twenty yeah. percent is discretionary, yeah, yes, exactly. and inevitably they can make the decision that yeah. their discretion is that you have to pay it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. 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 Oh, Ali, You've got the microphone on its way. So weird holding the microphone. That's not a microphone. <laughs> yeah, no, it's like a prop. Um, yeah, I, thanks for this. Um, I wanted to pick up this idea that the funding skip the whole strategy is completely broken. Because it's also about the timing, that when you're writing an application, you do put in so much. And last year I had two applications refused, even after going back and getting the information, I ended up curating a whole thing with involving other people and, you know, getting 100 quid for it. And it was just, you know... It's just epic amount of work, and that happens a lot. So the, it, it, Because you end up, when you're trying to plan something that's an event or involves, then, you know, you're basically having to plan two, two completely different events, one with funding and one without. And the one without basically costs us all money out of our own pockets that we don't have. And I think I really loved your example of the farm equipment, that actually it doesn't need to, and that's so true, that they do, they hold files. I mean, 
every single, you know, we're, uh, files are held on us about everything, you know, from our DNA to our, mm. you know, social media things. And then for some reason, every time, yeah, we do an arts council application, you have to reintroduce yourself. And I think, yeah, that's perhaps the sort of place for protest there because and also it's really really uh, inaccessible to neurodiverse you know for people with neurodivergency and Unless all of them autistic like i am and you have a special interest in fundraising activities. right <laughs> <laughs> okay yeah. yeah but it's just i mean it's also the timing of it and and you know often opportunities in art don't come very far ahead you know, so for instance, such as residencies or something like that. So you literally have no recourse for funding at all. Mm -hmm. And the amount of time, it's true, the amount of time you spend doing an arts council application, you might as well just work in a bookshop or something for that time. And you'd earn, more, you know, probably more money and you'd be sure that you would get that money. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, it does, it needs to totally change. And it, I mean, it is, it's, you know, I was surprised it's even a third that are getting funded. It feels right now like it's a lot less. Yeah. I don't know hardly anyone that's getting well, funding. Continued, yeah. <coughs> what's that called? Continued professional practice grant. DYCP, developing, yeah, your, yeah, developing your creative your practice. practice. Mm. <coughs> there are a lot of those of those which are like for two or three grand. Mm. So the people who are applying for money that's over ten grand, way fewer of those are getting through, and it depends on your what's being applied for in that quarter. Yeah. So if you're or in that month whenever they do the assessment. So if suddenly a million pounds worth of grants are applied for in that month, you just not, no one's going to get funded apart yeah. from the Royal Opera House. You know. I mean, yeah, and they don't even give you feedback either. Yeah. And, and no. it's just, yeah, just yeah. other projects were, were preferred. That's yeah. what they say. And yeah. that's nothing yeah. you can do. Yeah. yeah. But, yeah so even then, it's not even a question of eligibility, is it? Or, no. you know, it, it's, you meet the requirements. My first uh, Arts Council application, I was successfully unsuccessful. Uh, <laughs> uh, they said, yeah, you met all the requirements, mm. but it's just too competitive exactly. now. Exactly, too many people. You know, yep. so it's this idea of um, you've achieved it. There's nothing else you could have done differently, but no. Mm. And I also think, if I can add just one, I, I do think that also sort of we still have the idea that we have this Arts Council funding which means that, you know, in the states where you don't have really any public funding at all, but then there's many more kind of private benefactors and people like that, and we don't have that. So we're kind of no. like the, the, the public funding is, has gone, but we don't have that kind of idea of sort of patronage in the same way that, no. that, that, that countries that haven't. So it's this all, really all difficult. All those private trusts, trusts were hit by Liz Truss. Yeah. And they, they're dependent mm. on share price. Mm. And if the share prices go down, their, their endowments will lose value. They're not getting the income, yeah. so they haven't got the money to distribute. So the, the, whole, the whole system is really interlinked um, in a rather depressing and intractable <laughs> way. <laughs> but, I mean, we've got, I don't know how long charities have existed, 2,000 years, probably? No. A thousand years, charities yeah. have existed in the form that they currently exist, and we have to. Un I think we need to really unpick that. Mm. We went to a really invigorating um, seminar about governance with a heritage organisations, and the guy who was leading it. The first thing he says, the way that we govern charities is completely broken, mm. and I've never heard anyone in authority say that mm. before. And it's absolutely true, we're inundated with tiny bits of administrative detail mm. that we have to deal with. And it's elevating. I mean, you just, how do you operate? And then somewhere where you've got to produce all this paperwork and everyone has to read it. It's like... Well, does anybody read it? Yeah, that's yeah. that's the question. Read does anybody actually read these policies? Yeah. Could you put things in, could you use them like Trojan horses maybe yeah. and put other stuff in them? I don't know. I think we've still got time for another question. There's one at the back. Yeah. Hello. Um, I found this absolutely fascinating because I worked as a grant maker oh. for five years, 20 years Thank ago. You very much. But it, it was, it, well, I mean, it was interesting though because I suppose all the things that you're talking about are things which I was lucky. I worked for a 400 year old foundation. I was the first proper full time member of staff. So within a year and a half of becoming a grant maker, I ended up at the Association of Charitable Foundations at a European symposium. Um, doing two seminars and how to develop grant making strategy because all the things you were talked about and coming from effectively the other side yeah. with receptive trustees we were able to introduce so I have a tremendous amount of sympathy um, 
and, and hopefully some understanding as well for what you're saying. Well, I think everyone's working in good sense. Well, they are, and, I, and that's, the, that's the question. I mean, this is why it's not at all an aggressive question. It's almost, it's a curious question. It's a bit designed to be sort of kind of not provocative, but amusing, which is the sense that, as you've identified, it's such a demanding thing at the moment. The way I described it, people would say, almost feel like Father Christmas, and it wasn't. It was Scrooge. Because mm. if you're doing your job right, you're making a distinction between the excellent and the downright unbelievable, and you fund the unbelievable because your job as a grant maker is to make sure these fantastic 70% of applications yeah. coming in are really as good as possible. Mm. But I'm really curious about relationship, and I think I just wanted to touch on maybe what you see happening with regard to the people involved in having to try and make these decisions, or even, as you've described, who you feel might not be in a position to influence these quite large funders. Because I think one of the kind of things I've, I've experienced over the last 20 years, I suppose, is, is remaining friends with many of those people. And then looking back and thinking, gosh, we used to spend all our time trying to figure out how to get money out of you. And you really were being genuine. It was like, well, talk to me. Because by talking to me, I can influence people, even though it might not appear to be. So I'm curious with regard, I suppose, a tremendous understanding of how frustrating it is and also critical it is what you do. But there's something about this quality of relationship to be able to see that person in role as a person. And it's almost the exchange of curiosity. The last thing I'd say as well is that I believe I was genuinely interested in people's projects and what was going on. That was my responsibility as a funder. But people would admit, well, you were kind of money to us. <laughs> yeah. And the nature of it, there is a discrepancy in power, so of course that would be true, and yeah. I don't fool myself. But the question, I suppose, is anything you took from that with regard to, as, you, as you've all said, you know, these are jolly nice people doing an almost impossible job. What is the thing about the relationship between you all that can help those words getting into people's ears? And in my case, I had direct contact with trustees so we could do cool stuff. It's probably gone completely back the other way, because it would do. But a lot of the things you're recommending is what we're able to do because people spoke to me and continue to speak to me, and then I could influence the structure that I had. Uh, yeah, I think that's a you know, re really good point, really good kind of question to kind of push it back on. And, and, and it's also a kind of um, a, a charge to kind of push it back to, uh, to us as kind of cultural producers. It's, it's not simply about um, give, us, give us more money, um, we're important. It's you know, um, how can we kind of stake, stake a different kind of claim uh, to our importance? I don't know. And indeed, not just to talk, to have a relationship with funders, but with each other more. I think too often, um, it's probably a bit of a kind of Tory agenda underpinning it already, that we, we, we're in competition yeah. with each other. You know, you're talking there about um, one, two applications going in, one's going to get it, the other one isn't. Yeah. How, how, how could we as, you know, as, a, as a collective of artists, collective of curators, collectives of, a collective of thinkers, uh, kind of collaborate around, with solutions around that, where we may be kind of sh sharing what that is. I don't know if, if, if it's going to be limited. Otherwise, it's this kind of Darwinism that kind of um, that we that we have to kind of compete with this, you know, this kind of competition. Um, so much of it's been automated. Things like Grantium, of course, it's just it's just yet another kind of. There's a, such a coldness to that that it's just a digital interface where you are putting reports in that you are quite confident aren't being read, and yet you're supposed to maintain an ongoing... I'm not sure if all of my uh, reports have been read. But. From my discussions with assessors at the Arts Council, they actually read everything and are really diligent and really sweet, nice mm. people. Mm. And they're gutted when they can't find things. Mm. And they, there are things they put forward that they really, really want to be funded and... and the committee has to say, mm. you know, we just haven't got the money. Well, I, I, there's also these different stages of reports. Is that I'm, I'm almost talking more about evaluation reports, which yeah. I think are a different category maybe than applications. But um, what could we do? Just that kind of final point to kind of ad address this idea. Um, you know, thinking into the, into the future, could, how, how might we work around this or think of different kind of strategies? Uh, uh, just to kind of spin it around, is when I was operating in the 2000s, I did a lot of work with getting artists into museums, that was kind of my thing, and we were funded by Nesta, mm -hmm. remember that? Mm -hmm. And they were, they were really generous funders. Really generous, generous funders. 
Nesta was the National Endowment for Science, Technology and the Arts, and they took the arts part of it very seriously in the 2000s, and then when the Conservatives got in, that was just jacked, and they just went for, I don't know what they do now, totally unintelligible. Um, and But that relationship was developed because I gave a paper at a conference in Banff in Canada, and someone from Nesta was in the audience, and they liked the idea of the project that I was talking about. So, but that's a kind of cosy matiness that is very fruitful, but is really open to abuse. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, so I think that was the other half page of my rant, was that, which I didn't discuss, <laughs> was that you have to really avoid that as well. Like, you can't have this, oh yeah, nudge, nudge, uh, we're, you know, fund our project that's actually not very good, but fund it anyway, because we, you know, we know each other, and I'll take you out to dinner. <laughs> just, a t just a tiny one. We introduced something um, based on the single application form. So although we were outside London, it was this idea that rather than people s filling in different forms, you know, this is 20 years ago, gosh, if they can fill in a form for us and we can give guidance, even if they're unsuccessful, if there are other people in the single application form pilot, they can go somewhere else. We can bring money into our area. And I just want to say that with regard to the multiple questions. So the organisations that were able to access money that hadn't before because they knew what to ask for, interesting things happen. I had somebody rant at me. They, they got me on the phone and they said, do you know, before you came... I used to be able to write a letter to your trustees and I'd get a check back by return of post. <laughs> now, what I was able to do is tell my trustees that and say this person was very angry, but we'd actually introduce something that although it was arduous, it was not unique. They, if they went through it with us and they went through it with personal guidance, they could do something else. But again, that was 20 years ago and it's, it's depressing to hear from funders that they're starting to even think about that again when actually it was in place. There were pilots in there to do that, to save everybody time. Uh, or maybe a little bit resonate with what you're saying, um, because it has been um, a lot more of like based on having a meeting and doing personalized pitches directly with the funders. Um, I think that it's, uh, as you say, open to abuse, possibly, yeah. if it's based on friendship and chumminess. But it seems like it's, um, uh, like the motivation behind the shift is also just trying to um, make the best use of everybody's time and energy and to cut down on a lot of the administration. Like, the Danish, Danish funding administration is so much less bureaucratic than the UK's. Like, we've had... Um, we did a big uh, collaboration um, with a gallery in Manchester, and they produced like the longest, uh, the most comprehensive evaluation report I've ever seen. I was completely blown away, but it was something like 80 pages, and I think we submitted like a two-paragraph. Like it was good. It was just you know, yeah, we it was just it. yeah. So I think there's this, there's definitely a, a movement towards kind of keeping things a bit more like simple. And with the applications, like um, more and more you see, just call us first, talk to us first. We will let you know if it's worth your time to do an application. Um, and then there's a lot of funds that actually don't accept applications anymore because they have their own, um, their own strategies of like what they've, that yeah, they have, it's becoming more and more common where it's like instead of funding projects, they want to try and fund some sort of like prob like some sort of research or problem solving initiatives and then they have like within their own trustees and boards and things like different kind of um, thematic focuses that they decide is going to kind of um, guide their funding principles and then it's much more based on like finding projects that they can kind of develop together with the um, people who are receiving the funds. A for that. Yeah, is it happening here yes. as well? Yeah, yeah. And, it, and yeah. It's basically, it's a top down. The, the trustees decide, yes, I'm interested in milk bottles. We'll only fund things about milk bottles. Mm -hmm. And it's completely arbitrary. It's not what anyone is in, actually interested in. And then I remember this thing in the, when the Welcome Trust, clearing the room, <laughs> it's the milk bottles. Uh, the uh, 
the Wellcome Trust decided they were going to fund art science projects to do with, uh, and so everyone suddenly started doing art science projects, all the artists. And then the Arts Council started funding loads of new media stuff. Everyone did loads of new media stuff. And now you don't see any of that work. And it's, um, and I think that top down thing, well, the Renaissance is a good example of top down. <laughs> you can get some great stuff out of it, but it can also work the other way. Well, you know, we're back again. Well, we come back round to that, to all the way back to the beginning. This idea of you know um, f form and, and funding, and uh, where there are pockets of funding, all of a sudden you get some forms that are taking advantage of it. The cult uh, cultural Olympiad was another kind of quite bizarre at times uh, idea where yeah. you know funding that attached to, to sports during the Olympics all of a sudden artists were trying to find tenuous links between their painting practice and hockey <laughs> yes. or, or, or yeah. Olympic boxing or, yeah. or whatever quite bizarre you can have the final word Eve is there anything that you'd like to add there around <laughs> um, what we might be able to do uh, in relation to relationships um, well, I think the it's more like a value system kind of matching more so, but one of the things we had to struggle with it was kind of justifying the artist run as something that should be funded and wasn't um, like just for artists, a kind of insular mm. practice. Um, but that case has been made. So, and as you said, there are like trends of things that get funded. So we would look for outside sources, but it's like, often like European or national or local funding, but the, the the thematics kind of run through all of those. Um, but another thing, our, we actually run our main program as an open call. And it used to be that artists would pay us a very small amount to use the gallery when we had like no funding. And we were able to argue for paying artists to exhibit with us and then we give them supports. But because of that open call, it's for eight exhibitions and we get like 286 applications last year for those shows. So it like flips it and then you become the person that has to go through yeah, all of the applications exactly, yeah. and deliver, you like know. 20%. Yeah, uh, all of those, I'm really sorry, your application was great. It's just that there's such a high standard and we just don't have the time or the capacity mm. to do it. So it's really difficult in that sense. Um, seeing it from the other side. <laughs> that's that's, that's a, good, a good point to end on, I think. So yeah. thanks uh, to our speakers. Thanks to you for coming. Thanks for, to First Sight for hosting us. Mm -hmm. And uh, long live Sluice. Thank you. Thank you.